Bitcoin is close to becoming worthless. Now, what's the Bitcoin? The Bitcoin's like rat poison. Yeah. Oh. The greatest scam in history. Let's get it. Bitcoin will go to fucking zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you ungovernable misfits. I'm your host, Max. Everybody knows that Bitcoin is useless, worthless, and doomed to fail. But what if everyone's wrong? What if it's the system that is doomed to fail? Join me as I speak to some of the brightest people in the space and slither to the deepest, darkest depths of the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Welcome back, everyone. Today's guest is Yonat Vax. I recorded with her a few weeks ago for 21ism. She is currently still live and it's block six. So if you haven't checked that out already, go and have a look. The link is in the show notes. She's an incredible artist. The work is absolutely beautiful. And not only that, but she was very insightful. I had a really interesting conversation with her on lots of different topics. Thoroughly enjoyed the chat and thought it was worth posting here. I hope you all enjoy the episode and definitely go and check out her work. Thank you to CoinFloor UK for sponsoring the show. Anyone in the UK who's looking to dollar cost average, bi-weekly, you can do this from your own account. You can set up a direct debit and at any time if you want to you can just cancel it they're the only exchange i send friends and family to in the uk and if you are buying weekly or monthly and you use the code in the show notes you'll get 30 percent off next up is crypto cloaks my new sponsors for the show they're making some incredible stuff you probably already know about them but if you don't you are seriously missing out Go to CryptoCloaks.com, check out what they're building. It's Bitcoin only. You can pay in Bitcoin, you can pay with Lightning. They have some incredible node cases. Everything can be customized. I've got a couple of things coming to me that I am really, really excited for. You might have already just built your node and you've got it running. And like me, it's just sat there like, you know, just a Raspberry Pi on the side and gathering dust and you think, oh, you know, this deserves better. And it does deserve better. This is for your freedom so clothe it correctly go to cryptocloaks.com and if you do decide that you buy something from them and it arrives you've done something a little bit different you've maybe done something with the design that you think is particularly cool send me some pictures i'd love to see it anyway let's dive into the episode i really hope you enjoy any questions you can always reach out to me welcome to the show yonat vax as I've said to you before, I absolutely love your work. 21ism is very proud to be showing your work off and to have you in block six as our featured artist. Really, really looking forward to learning a little bit more about you and your work. But for anyone who doesn't already know you, can you do a little bit of an introduction, please? Yeah. First of all, thanks for having me. I love what you guys are doing. I think 21ism is really important. I mean, um, you know, to talk about Bitcoin culture and art, I think it's a fundamental part of this movement and you guys are doing really quality work and I'm honored that you asked me to to come on. So thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, so I've been doing, well, I think my journey towards art was a long one. It's always been a part of my life. I think I've always loved art I've always loved making things ever since I was uh, ever since I was little but um, I think it, it was a long journey until I really got to to doing this as a um, you know as a as a professional career I went through a lot of different different rabbit holes before I got into this one but I think I got into a point in my life where it was like you know what my real dream was always to be an artist I think it was always kind of like you know it's not practical or whatever and I I went to study different things but I got to a point where I was like you know fuck it this is what I want to do and I (laughs) I went to start you know I kind of 
I moved to a different country and I went to do like a little art course to, to get me started. And, and I just dove right into that. And to Bitcoin, I got, you know, to like Bitcoin art or to Bitcoin, I got in, um, I found out about Bitcoin in 2017. So just before the bull run, mm -hmm. uh, if you remember, there was that hack, uh, WannaCry. Do you remember that? Vaguely, I, I I didn't enter until right at the end of 2017. Okay. If you could pick the absolute top, yeah, <laughs> that was my entry. So it may have been slightly before, yeah. but it does ring a Perfect bell. Perfect timing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So WannaCry was in. I think it was in. It was just before. It was like in May of 2017. It was this uh, hack. It was big in Spain and England, actually. It was they hacked mm -hmm. uh, like the biggest telephone company in Spain and gas company and. In England, it was the health services, and they were asking asking for Bitcoin. and And when I read about it on the news, it was like, "Oh, what's this Bitcoin thing?" And um, you know, why why is someone going through all this trouble for it? Um, and that's when I got down. Um, that yeah, that's the first time I heard about Bitcoin, and um, yeah, that's when the whole journey kind of began. Interesting. It's like you thought to yourself, right? Someone's gone to a lot of trouble to do this hack. And they're asking for this Bitcoin thing. It must be valuable. Is exactly. that kind of okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like what you know, I was like, whatever hack, but this Bitcoin thing sounds interesting. So I'm gonna look this up. Yeah, it's interesting how we get pulled into it, both the art and Bitcoin. And you know, it was interesting when you said basically you hit fuck it. You were like, I just want to do what I love. And everyone pushes against it and says, you know, don't be an artist and, and certainly don't be involved in this Bitcoin thing and definitely don't do both. Yeah. But you, <laughs> you, you've got to that point, it sounds, where you're following your dreams and you're doing what you're passionate about. And that's a really amazing place to be in life. That's a place where you can build a real life from it because I think so many people are stuck in that rat race and, and they're too scared to, to chase their dreams. And it causes a lot of resentment. It causes a lot of problems within yourself that then you push on to other people, or, or certainly I did before being involved in art and Bitcoin. It's such a refreshing way to live and it's real and it's honest. And I think that's why we're seeing such great work in this space in particular. And, you know, I said to you before we started, the thing that I'm seeing with your work is it's so varied and it's amazing to see proper oil on canvas, like to see real beautiful work. You know, we'll get onto NFTs and we'll get onto the digital artwork and stuff at some point during the conversation. And I find a lot of that stuff great and I know you do it as well, but I've really been drawn to these oil on canvas you've done and also to the whale harpoon. <laughs> to have something uh, physical and it's just like I watched the video you did on the Twitter thread and the work that has gone into this we talk about low time preference in this space a lot this is proper low time preference art it's incredible so how did that come about where did you saying right I'm going to become an artist you find bitcoin because of this hack where did these two merge and uh, and you start creating bitcoin artwork the thing is that before I discovered Bitcoin or before I decided to dedicate myself to art, I really wanted to go into research. So I I had this, you know, fork in my life where it was either going to study art or going. And then someone told me about this college where I was close to where I was working that was for alternative therapy. And and I, you know, I, I obviously knew about it, but it was never something I thought about. And I always like to to learn about new things or just kind of discover things I don't know about. And I went to study that and I went down this huge, you know, another rabbit hole of, you know, the human psyche and, you know, alternate states of consciousness and kind of like why we do the things we do, why we think the way we think and after learning that, I really wanted to go to research about, about you know, mind, body or, or different states of consciousness. And I went to university to, to kind of follow that path of research. And I was 
you know, it was a really, really big disappointment <laughs> because I started learning, you know, psychology and I was sitting in classes with notes from people that were in the same professor's class from 10 years before. And he was practically, you know, all of them were practically saying the same things. And, and when I, when I told them that I was interested in like mind body um, work, you know, to study that or study different states of consciousness, they all looked at me like I was crazy <laughs> and it was it was a real this you know this this academia that was supposed to be you know the the place of knowledge and experimentation turned out to be a complete fraud and then that's when that's when i you know it was that pivotal moment of like you know what i can go do art and do my own research and make art about it and that's kind of like how all of my art is done it's it's like I get to read about things that interest me and make art about them. And, and that's where the low time preference comes from. It's like, um, it's like every artwork I do is like this journey into like I read loads of books and essays and everything about it. And it's like it's like a way to do, you know, research about something and, and create something out of that. Um, and I just love the process. You know, it's, it's not even the 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 final product, it's the whole learning about it. So yeah, that harpoon took me almost a year to, to make. Really? I mean, I, I say really, but that doesn't shock me at all. I can see the level of work that has gone into it. It's really, really incredible. It sounds like you basically, you're, you're enjoying your study and then you're documenting what you're learning from your study and you're doing that through your art rather than through a journal or a, or a written paper, or maybe you do both. That's an interesting way of doing things. And it's nice to break away from these institutions, which you, you know, you rightly say are, they're basically a scam at this point. It's like, you know, that you, you have to go with the status quo. Don't think, just remember, yeah, totally. just remember what we tell you and then sit an exam and then copy what we've told you. And if you copy it well enough and don't think for yourself, we'll, we'll give you a good grade. Exactly. And that's a shame. And, you know, if you look through history, all these studies and everything that people think they know are proven wrong. At some point, every diet, everything we think is healthy, you know, all these different things are always proven wrong. And it's weird that a lot of it is still called science. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. It's like it's the opposite. Yeah, I remember actually being in a class that it was about scientific research that says that science isn't about the truth it's, it's about you know discovering something until someone proves it wrong right mm -hmm. like that's the, mm -hmm. the the basis of scientific theory and and it was like well i want to study what you're doing that i think is wrong <laughs> and you're <laughs> just completely closed-minded to it you know the same professor that was teaching this was completely you know it was like we're just ridiculous and yeah mm -hmm. And was that, so it was psychology you were studying, was it? Yeah, it was, I started with psychology and philosophy and then biology to kind of study, yeah, mind, body work. But again, it was mm -hmm. just, yeah, it was just boring, honestly. Like when I, when I was studying alternative therapy, it was more, you know, through experience and through what we were, you know, we were practicing all kinds of things. And I learned so much more out of that, out of, my you know personal experiences than just sitting in a class and and you know a professor reciting things he's been saying for for 10 years now what alternative therapies were particularly interesting you that were sort of shunned by the professors was there anything or, or a couple that you were looking into and thinking wow you know i really think this is, is something important and, and could make a change and then they just sort of treated it like it was stupid or, or not of interest to them was there something in particular that you found through your experiences that you really thought was important well I think the moment you say alternative therapy to them they just look at you like you're crazy so it doesn't really <laughs> matter which one it is but um, I think the one that was most interesting to me was it's a kind of uh, breath therapy so you breathe in a certain way you kind of hyperventilate and mm -hmm. Don't ask me how, but it kind of alters your state of consciousness. So you okay. sometimes you get, you know, memories of things that happen to you or just physical 
Um, you know, you can, you can all of a sudden feel numb or feel your body is all tense or you start crying or it kind of, you know, in, in the same way that I think drugs kind of alter your state of consciousness in, you know, in a more, Mm -hmm. um, synthetic way, maybe then breath, you know, if you breathe in a certain way, if you get a lot more oxygen than you're used to, then your mind does that in a natural way. And, Mm -hmm. um, so one of the, one of the big, you know, someone that, that's, that participated in this or that invented like a certain form of breath therapy. He was actually in the, he was a psychiatrist that in the seventies was doing experiments with LSD because LSD used to be a psych, uh, like a um, therapeutic drug for, for psychiatric mm-hmm. patients until it became illegal. And he said that breath therapy was kind of does the same things as, as LSD, but brings up like memories or experiences that you're able to process. So what mm-hmm. LSD does is it brings up things that you're still that, you know, that maybe you're not ready to face, you know, demons from the past or whatever that you're not ready to face. And that's why, you know, people can go through really bad experiences with that. But with breath therapy, it kind of brings up things that you're ready to face. And I thought, you know, I learned so much about the way, you know, how in the first years of our lives we learn about, you know, we kind of create the beliefs we have about ourselves, about the world, you know, through just experiences that we have, it doesn't even have to be like these big traumas, just everything that happens in our lives, you know, affects the way we look at the world, we look at ourselves and, and it's, um, it's really, really interesting. And, and I think, you know, I brought a lot of that into the art that I do today, because I think a lot of the way we look at the world is part of you know, the, it's all stories in the end that we tell ourselves mm-hmm. as as individuals or as a society, and just I find it fascinating. Oh, I completely agree. You know what you're saying about you have these experiences and you you hold these experiences with you, and it, it forms your character and it forms our fears. And sometimes we don't even know what that experience was or why we behave a certain way, and it can be really detrimental at times. And I've heard so many people who have had great therapy with either ayahuasca or psilocybin mushrooms and all these different things that can sort of, they come out quite often saying, you know, I was just literally, I was looking at the world completely wrong. I was behaving wrong. You know, I was selfish or I was this or I was that. And and they, they feel cleansed and sort of more open afterwards it's something I've been too scared of personally, because yeah. I just know I would have a bad, <laughs> I know I'd have a bad trip. Um, what you're talking about with these breathing techniques I think that's great because uh, I mean at the end of the day a lot of these drugs are just unlocking other drugs that are released within your brain anyway and so I I can't see why this can't be controlled through meditation or breathing and these kind of things and um, that's fascinating and and, um, how does this impact your work you're saying this kind of you're, you're telling this story through your work do you still study those kind of things as well or have you now sort of moved on from that and and painting and and working is your main focus well I think you know these are still things that interest me so I still um, read about them I still try to do I haven't done the breathing exercises in a while but I really want to go back to that but I think it influences my work in a way that you know it kind of showed me how we again how you know, how we construct our reality in the end, you know, that I think there is no one truth. It's just how we, you know, the things that happen to us in our life or, you know, affect the way we look at the world. And I think that's correct for in for ourselves as individuals and for ourselves as society. You know, the things that we see in the world are kind of like stories we tell ourselves about the world or what you know, makes it easier for us to live in it or, you know, what defines the way we do the things we do. And that's why, you know, like the work, the work I've been doing about, about Bitcoin is always, you know, I take a certain subject that's connected to it and try to relate it to some other thing in history or in, in culture to, to kind of say, um, you know, 
Bitcoin is a new thing, but there's, you know, but don't forget, there's all kinds of things in humanity that are happening today and that are, that have happened in the past, mm. you know, kind of like connecting things between centuries or between stories. Yeah. So th let's, let's take that back to this um, harpoon, the crypto whaler, Basque harpoon, because that one just blows me away. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to take it back to that one. You said in one of the threads about crossing the Atlantic to the coast of Newfoundland, hunting whales and selling the oil for fortunes. And uh, I take it you're sort of relating that back to the hunt that is on now and the dangers around it and, you know, within Bitcoin and the people going out and risking something. Am I right in saying that or am I completely off base there? No, completely. I think... So when I started this this series, I think when you look at the things I've done through this series, it's kind of my, you know, my journey down the rabbit hole. And mm -hmm. I did a few paintings about different things. And then I got to this and, you know, one of the biggest things that are talked about are, are like, I think the whole theme of, of the sea, the ocean, voyages, new frontiers is you know, it's part of the vocabulary that talks about this whole thing, you know, more, more maybe in trading, but, but in general, you know, there's whales, there's liquidity, there's getting wrecked, there's, you know, going after new frontiers, new voyages. And the whole thing was like, okay, I want to do something about this. Um, and I've been doing a series and I, and I was doing a series of oil paintings, but I felt like I want to do something else, like not just a painting, maybe more like an artifact or something that's a bit different. And I was looking into this thing about just the whole thing about, I was looking, you know, I was reading about just whales or, or, or voyages to sea. And, you know, I've been living in Spain and, and then I read about the Basque whalers and I thought, wow, this is, this is perfect because, you know, it's these people that in the 16th century, you know, we're looking for something new and started this. It was like the first real enterprise of, of whale hunting ever. And they took, you know, these were people that took a big risk, you know, to cross the Atlantic Ocean then was a big risk. And, you know, when I was looking at videos of how whales are hunted and it's crazy, <laughs> like it's also a really mm -hmm. big risk. And, you know, they were doing something... I don't know, just the whole story had, had, was, you know, had similar things to everything that's happening with, with Bitcoin, the whole space in general. And I thought, okay, what can I do? That's not just a painting. And at first it was, I thought to actually you to do like a, like a ship, like, um, like a, a, a wheel of a ship. What do you call it? Like, um, I don't know, like the steering wheel. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not particularly yeah, boaty. Know. I've had a few boating accidents, but <laughs> yeah, uh, we no. all, we, we've all had them. Yeah, um, a wheel, I guess. Yeah, wheel. Um, anyway, and then it was like, okay, a harpoon could be really cool. And then I was still mm. learning about the Basque culture because I wanted to have, because you know, I was like, if I'm refer referencing these people, I want to talk about something about their culture. And I found out about. Um, the the maquila, which is what the harpoon is made of, which is like a traditional Basque walking stick. And the story of it is really interesting, like the way this is made. So I found an artisan in the Basque country that he's the only one that still makes it in a traditional way. And what he does is he goes out to the forest. These are made from meddler wood. So he goes out to the forest where there's like meddler trees. And the thing about this tree is that when you, when you do like insert insertions in the wood, like usually when mm -hmm. you, you know, when you carve out something in a tree, it stays like carved inside it. Right. But this tree mm -hmm. makes like these scars on top. So you can, oh, okay. you can make like scars in the tree and then it, it makes these, um, these little bumps that are the same. Um, so if you make, if, so if you make a circle, it'll make like a little circle on its branch that, that comes out, oh, right? Wow. 
Yeah, so that's so so they use so they found out about this and they use it. And what he does is he goes to the forest, he makes these like insertions in the wood to to create these like beautiful patterns. And then six months later, after the tree has made its scars, he comes and he chops off just that one branch, you know, not the whole tree. Mm -hmm. And then it's dried for for about 10 years almost. And then he makes, you know, he hand makes these um, walking sticks that have their, they have like silver engravings of certain symbols of the Basque culture. So the, the upper part of it opens up, you can unscrew it and there's, like a sword inside so these were used mm -hmm. also to you know like go for walks in the mountains or go with your you know with your sheep on the mountains and then if you find in if there's some kind of danger you have like a secret sword inside and and they're also like a symbol of respect and honor um you know sticks in general if you look back in history are like you know there's like Moses and his stick and you know sticks are like a symbol of of respect and I don't know I just the whole story I found fascinating and at one point I just went there you know I, I did like a trip to the Basque country and I met him um and I was also in touch with with the museum and there's a museum in Canada in Newfoundland of the Basque whalers. So they gave me the exact measurements of the harpoons because I wanted to make like an exact replica. And I also found a, um, a, um, what do you call it? <laughs> Someone that makes I forges and iron for the, for the harpoon spearhead. head. Right. And I didn't mm -hmm. know this, but when I went to meet him, he said, oh, yeah, I made the replicas for the museums about the Basque whalers. And I was like, oh, my God, perfect. <laughs> <That> <laughs> like, it was it. complete coincidence that I got to him, which I don't really believe in coincidences. I think they happen for a reason. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we made this harpoon from, you know, it's an exact replica, the exact measurements of the whaler of the Basque harp, you know, harpoons that were used. And then I painted like a story of a certain person on it with the story of the Basque whalers. And yeah, th th that's, the, <laughs> that's the story of that. I think mm -hmm. like I try to always go back to like another story in history to say like what's happening now is new and you know, it's a revolution and it's something we need to focus on. But there's a lot of things that are common that have happened already in history, you know. Yeah, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's so true. And yeah, and I, I love that you're collaborating with people on this. You know, that really, it, it makes me think of Bitcoin as well. Not only the story behind it, but Bitcoin to me is just a group of crazies who want a better world who are collaborating against all odds and whatever comes up against them we work together and create something incredible and and i like that you've taken the time to actually find people who can create the parts you want for this piece of art and the low time preference you're talking about you know 10 years for this piece of wood and the thought that's gone into it is very important because you get one chance. And, and again, with Bitcoin, it's one chance. We have one chance to do this properly. And if we take that analogy of us going to sea and going against the odds, what's your thoughts now that you've been in the space for some time and you're dedicating so much time to creating this work? What's your feeling of our space, our culture, where this whole thing's going? What are you thinking about? Is there anything that's concerning you or anything that's particularly exciting you within Bitcoin at the moment? You know, I think Bitcoin. So before I discovered Bitcoin, I was at a point where I was like, you know what, I just want to run away, live in the mountains and hope I die before, you know, the world goes to shit. <laughs> like, I think it was kind of like. Relatable. Yeah. Like, I just felt like the dystopia is coming really fast and there's nothing we can do about it. And I didn't want to know anything about technology, really. Like, I was like, I don't want to know anything. I just, I just want to run away and hope, you know, it doesn't reach me. <laughs> and when I found out about Bitcoin, 
you know, obviously it, it took, you know, a journey to understand what it really is. But, you know, I think like, like most of us, when we heard um, Andrea's talk, it was like, wow. <laughs> For me, it was like, wait, there's hope. You know, there's, mm-hmm. you know, the, it's not, we're not doomed to, I don't know, you know, with everything that's happening now with Corona, it's, it's scary. You know, the, the scary part for me now is not, not even what governments are doing. It's the fact that people are just taking it, you know, like not even mm-hmm. taking it. It's like they're agreeing with it. Um, yeah. And, and so it's scary on one hand, but on the other hand, I feel like, okay, you know, th- these part, again, you know, if you look back in history, there have been, you know, empires have fallen and then something better was created. And I think, you know, Bitcoin gives that hope for that something better that is being created. Not that we're not in for, you know, bad times. I think we are, but it kind of gives hope that, you know, there's something on the other end of the tunnel. And I think the poetic thing for me about Bitcoin is that, you know, that the Bitcoin doesn't care. Like it doesn't matter how the people that use Bitcoin are, you know, that it on one hand, you know, it's, it's peer to peer. It's something that makes the world a better place. And simultaneously, it doesn't matter if the person that using it, that's using it is evil or not. It just doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the beauty of it. You know, the, like, the poetic thing about it, that it can make the world a better place place you know and it doesn't need the benevolent dictator or the or or just it doesn't even need a benevolent person you know you can be evil and use bitcoin and it doesn't even matter you know <laughs> it's like above that kind of yeah it's just a tool yeah. it doesn't need a, a marketing campaign it doesn't need politicians behind it it doesn't need any of that it just is and it works and slowly but surely people are finding it and they're finding it from all different ways you know like you you just had your ears to the ground and realized oh if someone's going to take the effort to hack and do all of this for bitcoin it must have value so you've come in like that you know other people they'll see a piece of art or or hear some music or they'll read a magazine or they'll see something which just piques their interest and then a, a very small percentage will go, right, this is the most interesting thing on the planet. I'm going to dedicate all my hours to learn about it. And and then they end up on Bitcoin Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's just a, just a few people on there. But it feels like it's growing. And it's lovely to have, I think, you know, what, what 21ism really we're trying to do is create like a snapshot each month uh, for each block of what are people saying? Like, what's happening within Bitcoin? What's happening in the world? And documenting it, documenting what are artists saying? What are developers doing? And how is this changing month by month? And trying to have one place where people can go and go, right, okay, that's what was happening then. Because I kind of feel, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, unless it's documented properly, some of this will be lost, some of it will be forgotten. And that's such a shame because this industry and the people in it are fascinating and passionate and it's such a different feeling to what I've ever experienced before uh, to have these sort of people who really care really passionate really you know that they're not scared to try and say yeah I'm going to try and change the world and they're not scared that people are calling them crazy and they're not scared that they're going up against you know the most powerful people on the planet they're just saying no we want change and, and we're going to do it and and that's really an inspiring thing it's it's uh, yeah it's awesome to be around i love it yeah completely i think it's really important i think also when when you look back at you know at, at changes in in you know revolutions or in history you kind of look back and you admire the people that were going against the system you were like wow how did they see what nobody else saw but you know i think when if you if we were able to talk to those people they would have said you know even when you read their story, it's usually a story of, of, you know, everybody hated them. Everyone thought they were crazy. And, you know, their story came out just in, in retrospect. And um, the outcasts and the misfits who, who make the change and then everybody else retrospectively, they, they go back and say, oh, yeah, we always knew. 
yeah, yeah, that's what's <laughs> going to happen. <laughs> it, it's always that way. Um, but yeah, that, that's the great thing with art is that you can document these things and, and a picture paints a thousand words. And, um, you know, I've, I've liked looking through some of the things you're doing. That one, Another thing that particularly interests me was this uh, five generations that you've done and looking back through time. And there's some beautiful work on there. It really is lovely. And, and I wondered how that came about. What sparked you to, to, to look back into the past and, and document it? That was one of the first things I painted when I, you know, when I decided this was what I was going to do. And I think for me, it was just kind of like a personal journey. And the, so the five generations is, is a series about my great grandmothers. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm from Israel. I come like I'm a, my, both of my grand, well, almost all my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. And this was kind of like a personal journey. You know, I was, I was going through photos that my grandmother had of, um, just of her family. And honestly, it was just a personal thing to go through, you know, what she went through, you know, losing all her family to, I also think it's relevant today, you know, it's, it's, you know, losing her family to, to a horrible thing that happened in the past and what she went Mm -hmm. through and how she, you know, um, started her life over with everything that she went through. And it was kind of like a way to get in touch with, with the past, with my past that I never knew. Um, Mm. And yeah, I think about that a lot today, you know, because so, so both of my grandmothers and one of my grandfathers, they were, you know, they were all Holocaust survivors. And my other grandfather, his father saw what was coming and, and moved to South Africa before the Holocaust. And, you know, I think about that a lot today. It's like, you know, you look at the Holocaust and you think like, oh, that will never happen again. That was just this horrible Mm -hmm. thing that happened in the past. And, you know, we know better, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you, and, and we have to remember that we don't know better. You know, there was, you know, the population that was living then, they weren't evil. They weren't different. You know, they were manipulated just like we Mm -hmm. can still be manipulated today. And, you know, I... I, We are being. Yeah, we are being. And, you know, I see, you know, I know both my grandmothers that went through this and how this affected their lives, you know, you know, going through the the greatest horrors of of the last century and how that affected, you know, their life and their children's lives and, you know, even our lives in a way, you know, this is generational. It doesn't stop with the person that's actually going through this. You know, it, it, it leaves scars for generations in the end. Absolutely. It leaves scars, but it also, um, it also builds us. It toughens us and, and that passes through the generations as well. I think it's such an important thing that you've done there, looking back at the past and, and by creating this artwork, you're really learning where I think a lot of people you know, I've been guilty of it myself. I've, I've lost all my grandparents now. And, and I got very, very close with my grandmother before she passed. She was uh, going through a similar, without doxing myself, um, not, a, not a particularly good time. And the stories that she's told me, I, I'm sure have shaped some of the way I think about the world. Um, because as you rightly say, people don't see things coming they are manipulated they're not evil you don't just have an entire country or an entire area where every person there is evil but people can be manipulated and they can be forced and the manipulation techniques are becoming possibly more sophisticated harder to notice and um, some of these things play out over a very long time but um I think more people should take the time to look back at history, listen to what their grandparents tell them, and actually it gives you a better way of looking into the future and seeing what could possibly come and, and act on it because uh, otherwise it's suddenly there and, and then it's too late. And um, that's one thing that I see a lot is, is people taking the time and the space to consider the possibilities, to consider what's coming. 
and prepare for it and try and spread that message and and allow others to see it but it's very hard so when you're saying about your was it your grandfather or your great grandfather fleeing to south africa is there is there any documentation from him or anything in the family where anyone listened or was it just he fleed and, and no one would no one could see it that's a good question. I've never, um, well, my grandfather is not alive anymore. I don't know what his, it was his great, it was his father. My grandfather mm-hmm. was a child then, so it was his father that saw it coming. I don't, I actually don't know if the rest, you know, what, if he told other people or his family or he just kind of did it himself. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think we don't, you know, I, I actually saw a video a few days ago of a Holocaust survivor that was talking about, you know, she was she was describing things that were happening then, and it was like she was describing today. You know, it was crazy, it was mm-hmm. scary. And, and you know, you see it, and you, you still, because you don't want to believe, you know, nobody wants to think they're being manipulated. And... And, you know, when you see these things, you're like, yeah, but that's today's difference, right? (laughs) This won't, you know, it's not happening now. You just don't want to believe it. And I understand, I totally get, you know, that people don't want to see it because you just don't, you know, you want to believe the world is a good place. You want to believe people are good. You don't want to believe you're being manipulated and, and, you know, but it's the same techniques are kind of, being used today and 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 just like you said i think today the tools that can be used are much greater you know when you think of how social media works and the internet and it's just it's so much easier today than it ever was Mm. it's so sophisticated and it's become so part of our lives people spend so much time in front of a screen and they, they don't realize it you know a lot of it is just repetition brainwashing and it's subtle enough that people don't see it. it's only it's almost all, all only once you see it you can't unsee it but until you see it it's just completely invisible to you and it's so well hidden and the more the masses believe the more you spend time around people who believe what's being said the harder it is to wake from it because you know we are all to some extent sheep and you know we all do follow crowds to some extent you know I I find that uh, sometimes I have to catch myself when I'll think a certain way and then be like "Mm, am I really thinking that have I really thought this through like could I be wrong here and I have to go through it step by step and and sometimes you're like no I'm actually wrong that's something that I've just jumped to a conclusion with and it's quite like a something you have to practice to stop that manipulation from working and and stop being scared and I think it's the fear that is is really particularly helpful for the people who are pushing some of the narratives because when people are scared they just don't think straight they just don't um they don't think. I guess. Yeah, no, <laughs> completely. Straight, and think. and I think in a way we all want you know someone to take care of us in a way. So and and you know we've been taught that governments take care of us and and want what's best for us, right? And mm-hmm. and you don't want to believe that's not true. You want to believe that's true. And and I think you know you see all these things that are happening in the world, and and I totally understand that you want to bury your head in sand and just hope for the best, right? Because you know you kind of have this like, what can I do to change this? And um, yeah, is it influencing your work at the moment? That some of these ideas that you're thinking about and and some of the concerns you have. Is there anything that you're currently working on that's been influenced by that? You've sent me through some beautiful work for our website that people will probably be seeing now as they listen to it when it goes live. But I don't know the, the story behind this because I've only got the picture, but the cuckoo, the cloud cuckoo land one. Yeah. I don't know the story behind it, but I'm really drawn to it. It's beautiful. It's just, as soon as I opened it up, I was like, I love that. But I've got to be honest, I don't know the story behind it. Could you tell me? Yeah, so that series, I did like a f- four artworks. And this was, I did this right when the lockdown started a year ago. 
Um, so we kind of escaped, I guess, or I don't know, found ourselves in the mountains when the lockdown started. Mm. So it was kind of a, uh, you know, I was in nature and all these things were happening. And, and even when it was happening, I thought, you know, this is, this is crazy. Mm. I mean, now when you look back, you, you know, it's crazy, but also <laughs> then it was like, okay, is this, you know, I had, I was conflicted about it. Right. I was like, okay. Because, you know, in, in March of, of last year, you know, you were seeing all these videos from China, from Wuhan, and it was like, well, is this really, really deadly? What's happening? You know, and, and I just felt like it felt like there's no more. You, you don't know where to go. You know, if, I think if before there was like, OK, you can maybe trust what the news are saying. It was all of a sudden like you, you, you can't trust anyone. You don't know anything. Nothing is real. You don't know. It was just kind of like this chaos that who knows who's telling the truth, who's not, what's happening, what's going on. You know, we can't leave our house. We have to wear masks. Like, what the hell is happening? And then that's when, so it was like this series of four. This this isn't necessary. This isn't specifically about Bitcoin. It obviously has a lot to do with it, but it was more about what was happening. The cloud cuckoo, so... Um, so cloud cuckoo land is this term that's used. Um, so it, it comes the the origin of it is from a Greek play that. So it, it's a it's a, a Greek play that's called The Birds. That it's like these um, Greek uh, citizens, Athenians, that are sick of the way of taxes and of the way you know the the city is being governed, and they want a different world. And then they go and they meet with the birds, with the, like the, you know, the leaders of the birds. And they say, we want to create this world between earth and the sky and live in a, like a cloud cuckoo land. And, you know, the birds are like, who, what, you're, you're are you crazy? <laughs> and like the moral of it is, is kind of like when someone wants something that's completely different, they want a cuckoo land you know like cuckoo mm -hmm. is considered like crazy right that's what i always thought yeah so cuckoo is like considered crazy and then cloud cuckoo land is like this crazy utopia that can't really happen and mm -hmm. it it's it's like a phrase that has been started to use that that was used in in politics so margaret thatcher when she talked about nelson mandela um she said you know if anyone thinks that black people can rule South Africa, they're living in cloud cuckoo land, right? They're like crazy, like that's mm. never going to happen. And so it's kind of like this political, it's now used as like a political statement against people that have these crazy utopias in mind. And and I kind of took that and, and um, you know, made this like weird... <laughs> you know, people, you know, like a woman talking to a lion and like a cuckoo bird there and kind of like, are you taking, the idea was like, are you taking what's been served to you on a plate right now? Or are you going to create a cloud cuckoo land? That's so interesting. See, I, a lot of these things, the way that words are changed and phrases are changed to suit agendas you don't even question and I, i've used are oh, you living in cuckoo land i've used it for years and and i've never even considered where where it came from and i have used it as like you're being an idiot you're, yeah. you're living in a dream world that that's so i never knew that and that makes me love the painting even more yeah that's really cool it's a nice uh, sort of way to flip it on its head <laughs> The idea of creating this new world is something that really resonates with, I think, most Bitcoiners. We're used to being called crazy and we're used to people sort of laughing at us and, 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 and changing what we're trying to do to, to sound as if it's bad and, and, you know, making Bitcoin sound as if it's bad and making us seem like we're trying to do what's not best for the world. But it's kind of, it's like an annoying place to live, but it's also quite fun. Do you find that you battle with people in your day-to-day -day life? Do you find that you're finding it difficult to interact with normal people? Or are you 
in a space now where either you've given up with it and you just spend time with people who understand the way you're thinking or are you lucky enough to be around people who are, are thinking in a similar way <laughs> um i think or I a think, mixture <laughs> yeah i think it's a mixture i think you know in a way you know the the fact that there's you know twitter and telegram you you can connect with people that think the same way i'm not you know i think in my in my um real life if people are not into this i don't hold it against them you know i get i get that some people you know see life the way they see it and i you know i think people have different virtues and if if they don't if they're not into this they have other things that i love about them and mm. and you know people think different ways you know that i don't need people to think exactly the way i think and um you know, in the beginning, I, I, I tried to tell people about Bitcoin and, and, and I, I still do. But at one point, it's, you know, sometimes it's like, the, oh, you know what? <laughs> because in, in the end, it's like whenever there's bad news about Bitcoin, you get all these messages about CCC and it's like, oh, it's <laughs> fine, whatever. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> and then it's like, okay, fine. just <laughs> Bitcoin's dead. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Exactly. The Bitcoin's dead. Bitcoin's ruining the planet. And, and it's like, <laughs> and then when there's good news, it's like I I actually wrote this to someone. It's like, hey, why don't I get the good news? <laughs> why are you only sending me when there's bad news? <laughs> um, <laughs> it is interesting. I think a lot of it is because people who haven't invested or aren't taking part in it, they kind of almost they want to see the bad parts because they want to feel like oh well I haven't spent the time for a reason it's not because I'm lazy or stupid it's because I'm smart yeah and that's why and so now I want to share the bad things and as soon as they are invested or they are spending time learning then they'll share the good things and so it's that confirmation bias that sort of kicks in but it is annoying I, I agree with you and I'm similar boat I just sort of can't be bothered you know like you say people have other things that you can speak to them about and you just ignore maybe some of the political views or the um, views on money and, and all the rest of it and you find the things that you can enjoy speaking about and it's it is pointless it's it's pointless and it just it causes a lot of conflict that's unnecessary and it just takes energy away and that energy is much better spent creating than arguing i think yeah exactly and um yeah, and no, I also think it's interesting to to connect with people that don't think the way you do, you know, that kind of look at life in a different way. And, and in the end, it makes you question. I think we always have to question everything, especially the things we really, really believe in. So, you know, in a way, even if someone doesn't think the way, you know, the way I do, I, I think there's a lot to learn from everyone so it's true i don't know if you've had a similar thought but i think sometimes what if we're all right and what if we do go to this hyper bitcoinized world and you know i, I think we will do eventually but do you ever have the thought of how is the world going to look like it's not all going to be sunshine rainbows like whatever happens going forward i think there's going to be this conflict there's going to be massive change in the next decade do you ever think about that? Like, do, do you have a thought of how this all plays out? Or are you more of the thought that, well, we can't guess how it plays out. I'm just going to keep myself to myself, uh, create a nice life, look after my family and, and deal with what comes. Yeah, no, of course I think about it. I, I actually read a book not long ago that was called um, The Collapse of Complex Societies. So it's um, it's this anthropologist that, that did a study about why complex societies, you know, like the Roman Empire, the Mayan Empire, and what, you know, what, why societies collapsed in the end and what happened after that. And I think one of the things that struck me the most was he said, you know, the, the Middle Ages, they're considered like this dark age um, that everything was really bad, you know, after, you know, before the Renaissance 
doesn't necessarily mean they were a dark age. It was just there was not a complex society that documented its, you know, its history or its art or its literature, or whatever. It was just, you know, little villages that kind of communicated between them and, you know, didn't have the ways to maybe you know, create all the things that we can now see in archaeological studies of, of empires. But it doesn't mm-hmm. mean it's a dark age. It doesn't mean it's a bad place. It just means it was different. And mm-hmm. I thought that was really interesting because I kind of feel like maybe that's where we're headed, you know, that we've gotten into a society that's too complex, especially if you look at, you know, like the European Union or just there's so much bureaucracy, there's so much, you know, complexity that it's just not sustaining itself anymore and people want out. And, you know, and maybe this, what's going to happen is, you know, smaller societies, you know, smaller um, models of of living, but it doesn't, ne- hopefully, you know, <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean a bad place. I don't know. I think we kind of have to think of all possibilities that will happen. I think that's what, in a way, that's what Bitcoin opened my eyes. It, like I said, if before I wanted to just bury my head in the, you know, <laughs> in the sand and just hope for the best. Now it's like, okay, well, there's all kinds of things that can happen. None of us really know. So we can just, you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And yeah. Um, yeah and, and, yeah, just hope for the best. I mean, I hope this this hyper bit bitcoinization doesn't happen from one day to another. I really hope it will take time because you know, I remember someone once saying, you know, you don't want to be the person that has everything when nobody else has anything. Mm-hmm. And and I really believe that, you know, I don't want society to collapse. That would be horrible. You know, even if it means, you know, Bitcoin is right or whatever, like I hope the transition happens slowly and surely and securely. So everyone, you know, so it's not traumatic. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. If you have all the money in the world and all the possessions in the world and you look out the window and all there is is shit it's not going to be very nice yeah. and and like you say people will be envious and they'll hate you for it and believe that it's your fault rightly or wrongly and yeah i completely agree with you this thing needs to happen slowly and you know as much as i get excited uh, to some extent with all the institutions coming in and these big buyers coming in i kind of at the same time wish they would go away and this wish there was this would stay more uh, grassroots and with the people because I don't know. I think there's such a small amount of people who have their hands on this and and who are sort of able to understand what's going to happen that if it did suddenly happen that all these huge businesses are putting it on their balance sheet and we do suddenly, you know, go up to a million a coin or something like that uh, quickly, it's it's going to price a lot of people out. And, And in the long run, it's going to be better because in the long run, nobody has the power to just create something out of nothing and steal people's time. Um, And that's incredible. You know, that is something that is going to change the world going forward. But that little bit of time in between, it would be nice to have more of a a smooth transition. And I think the, uh, the creativity would be better. Like we want as many people to be joining this movement as possible. We want people to be excited about it, to be building, to be collaborating and, and and like a new renaissance you know this is this is something where we can do something special and uh, I, I i really hope it does pan out that way yeah yeah totally like i think it it slowly but surely is is the way to go mm. yeah fingers crossed well <laughs> look i uh i don't want to take your whole day i i wasted your time by not telling you uh, no. to get your lap, so apologies again for that <laughs> And yeah, I just wanted to say, look, firstly, I've really enjoyed the conversation. It's We've gone all over the place and talked about lots of different subjects. It's been fascinating. I wasn't aware of what you've done in the past and why you had come to Bitcoin and, and why it resonates with you. So that was really interesting to hear. And like I said to you off air, I really seriously love your artwork. I'm 
blown away by it. It's very, very different. And 21ism is very proud to be showing this. It's, it's incredible. And anyone who is listening to this who hasn't already checked out your work, where can they go to see what you're doing? You can just point them towards the website and Twitter and anywhere else you might want them to have a look. Um, yeah, my website is uh, yonatbax.com, so Y-O-N-A-T-V-A-K-S.com. Um, my Twitter is the same, Yonatbax. Yeah, and um, I, I actually have a new artwork that I'm working on now with, uh, with the great Chief Monkey. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah. So, Anything you can tell us about it, or is it yeah, still we, secret? Yeah, we we revealed the first part of it. So we did um we did a piece about we called it the Bitcoin Bava Kakra. So the um, oh yes 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 I've seen this. you've seen it yeah it's um so we kind of took the the wheel of uh, samsara from the Buddhist uh, from from Buddhism. So Buddhism says there's um. There's, you know, we're all trapped in the samsara, like the suffering in life. And and the way to escape that is to understand that, you know, nothing is really real. And we have to, um, you know, look at our fears in the eyes and kind of ascend from them. So we we kind of took all those teachings and related them to Bitcoin. So it's kind of like the wheel of fiat samsara. Um, and we did, um, there's this painting of, of the, the Yama, who's, who's like the, the monster that represents this, in, this fear and impermanence. And he holds the samsara, like the wheel that, that shows, you know, all the things that keep us inside, you know, the suffering of, of human life. And yeah, so he did a beautiful work you know with laser laser cutting and and painting of of the monster and i'm painting the part inside of all the the different realms you know the different cycles you go through until you understand um bitcoin and the things that kind of leave us inside the fiat circle you know like consumerism and debt and um surveillance and social media and and yeah We'll be revealing it a bit by bit. This is, I'm looking at it now. I've seen parts of it, but it's, yeah, it's very, very cool. And this is going to be auctioned, am I right? Yeah, it's going to be auctioned on Scarcity on the 9th of April. I look forward to seeing that. I will be saving my pennies. (laughs) (laughs) Saving my sats. All right, well, as I said, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and and learning about uh, everything that you're doing. I'm really excited to be showcasing your work and uh, hopefully at some point when all this corona stuff sorts itself out and people uh, start thinking clearly, it would be great to catch up in in real, in person somewhere. Yeah, I'd love that. Thank you for having me. Any final thoughts to leave people with? Um, I don't know. (laughs) Learn about Bitcoin. um... (laughs) That's very good. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think I think an important thing that that made me understand it way better than than any, you know, there's something about earning Bitcoin that makes you understand it in a different way. So, you know, my advice to a lot of people instead of, you know, also, you know, stacking stats and buying. But if you can find a way to earn Bitcoin, you get it on a whole different level, I think. Um, Completely agree. Very, very wise words to finish on. Thank you. (laughs) Okay. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.